Jamie Richards, welcome to the Wolf Den. Thank you. Um, so I called this podcast The Global Trainer because you've had incredible success in New Zealand, great success in Australia, and then you decided to sort of throw it all away and start from zero in Hong Kong and obviously try and achieve that, that same success there. So it makes a great storytelling. I thought we could sort of unpack all those different storylines. Sure. thought we might start in Australia and in particular the racing at the moment because in different ways you can give us a lot of insight on some of the best horses that are racing in Australia at the moment. First horse I wanted to talk about was Romantic Warrior. Obviously he raced in the same jurisdiction as you all last year. And what did you make of his run on Saturday? I thought he ran really well first up. Um, he had a few little things go against him in Hong Kong before he left. Uh, we had a typhoon come through, uh, which meant he missed a trial. Um, and he probably just left Hong Kong um, a little bit underdone compared to where Danny wanted him, I, I would have thought. Um, had a little bit of trouble with his feed. Um, so there was just a few little niggly things going on behind the scenes, which I believe can affect the horse's performance. Um, and certainly uh, the way that the race was run, uh, he drew a little bit of a sticky gate, had to go forward. He just sort of got caught out a little bit. He wasn't able, James wasn't able to just sort of flop out from one or two and just drop his hands. He sort of had to go forward, get a position, over raced, just probably went 20% too keen through the middle stages and then was just a little bit vulnerable late. But uh, fair and square, he was beaten. But I would say that he's the big improver out of the run and uh, I certainly wouldn't be dropping him out of uh, Cox Plate calculations. Do you think the Australian punting public expected a bit too much of him first up, considering he hadn't raced since May? Um, well, I think the Australian racing public were probably a little bit mindful of where he was at, but I think what drove the um, uh, his short odds possibly on Saturday was that it was a world pool race. Uh -huh. uh, so there would have been a lot of money from Hong Kong coming into that pool, which probably I, I would say made him shorter than what he would have been if it was mm. just, an, uh, just an Australian um, uh, tote, you know, with, mm. without international participation. So... Um, Look, I, I don't think people would be disappointed. Obviously, they want to see horses from our, our jurisdiction go and race and, and perform. But the odds uh, of him winning, like I think there'd been something like 47 runners from Hong Kong and one horse had won. So mm. it was going to take something very special for him to win that race. Uh, he he ran well without winning. So, um, yeah, as I say, I, I think there's improvement to come. Um, I'm sure if they were able to find... A suitable race that was perhaps over a mile rather than 2,000 first up that may have suited the horse better but just with the way that Danny and James and the owner had planned it um, I'd say there'd be significant improvement into the Cox Plate. Yeah are you across the Cox Plate form have you got a tip for us or? Um, I, I follow it um, I think after Saturday you're going to know exactly where you're at I think uh, Mr Brightside seems to have gone to another level this preparation mm. I think uh, the boys have done a great job with him. He's, he's racing really well. So he's up here for the um, King, Charles. King Charles on yeah. Saturday, which will be interesting. And then obviously you've got uh, Amelia's Jewel running in the tour rack on, on Saturday as well. And just watching her gallop at um, Caulfield there on Twitter this morning, she looked like she was going really well. So, mm. um, yeah, there's a, there's a few different uh, moving parts. And then you add a couple of internationals in. Um, obviously Gold Trip was... Massive in the term, but where does he go? I th don't think they've decided just yet. So there's a lot of things going to play out in the next week or 10 days. Mm. It's going to be a great race. It is going to be a great yeah. race and it, 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 it deserves to be. It's a high pressure race. Um, so yeah, looking forward to looking forward to watching that. Yeah. And we can talk about a horse who's going to race on Cox Plate Day in the Manicado Imperatriz. So a lot of people wouldn't know, but you actually, a lot of people watching this podcast would know, but you actually trained two of the best horses in Australia before you went to Hong Kong. I wish I win an Imperatriz. Um, firstly, with Imperatriz, were you surprised how well she went in the McEwen first up? Um, no, I think uh, I think Mark and, and the team there at Tiaka have done a great job with her. She was a, a three-year-old when I was there and because the um, prize money races in, in, in New Zealand are sort of geared around a mile, 14 and a mile, and we were sort of trying to get her to run that trip and she won mm. her group one and then she's been able to sort of be freshened up and brought back and trip and most of the I'm Invincibles are good sprinters. So um, first up, 
you know, everybody's seen what happened with Giga Kick and this and that. And it just it just mapped perfectly for yeah. her as soon as she got his back and then she was able to let rip. He was a bit vulnerable first up and then obviously pulled up with that issue. So um, she's a wonderful mare. Uh, she's got a great turn of foot and uh, she's been very well managed by the team there and seems to handle the valley really well. So, yeah, um, yeah hopefully she'll, she'll run really well again uh, this coming this coming week. Or, or when is that? To, to, is that yeah, I think it's they've two, changed it, right? So it's the yeah. same day now. I'm pretty sure it's on Cox Plate Day. Yeah, so that'd instead be, of the Friday night before. Yeah. yeah. Um, and did you... We're going to talk about Tiako and the Tiako operation soon, but did you guys buy Imperatriz as a yearling? Yeah, Dave bought her at uh, Magic Millions, paid uh, 360 grand for her. So she was, uh, um, I guess, a medium sort of budget play for an Ironman Mitsu at that stage. I think if you went to buy her now, now that he's the champion selling, you'd have to pay a lot more for her. But yeah. um, uh, she wasn't a big, strong um, sort of filly. She was... Um, well proportioned, um, medium size. She came out and raced really well as a two year old. Won her first couple of starts, I think. She won the eclipse at um, Ellerslie on New Year's Day. Um, so she she always showed a, a lot of ability. Had a few little niggling issues up high behind, but uh, as I say, I think credit to Tiako and the team there. They've done a wonderful job to manage her and keep her sound. And she's obviously going really well. And so, what you talked about then leads me to another question, which is. When do you know that you've got a superstar? So, you know, Imperatriz, absolute superstar. I wish I were an absolute superstar. Both of those horses, you would have had a lot to do with them very early on in their education. And in general, all these good horses that you have, you've had, when do you know that they're going to be absolute top liners? I think most of them show it reasonably quickly. Mm -hmm. um, first trial, they'll step out and trial well. And then most of them just keep improving. So uh, I think it's there from from day one some horses take a little while to wake up and understand what's going on but most of them show it from a very very early stage in their career and i'm sure most, most trainers would say the same yeah yeah and so i wish i win um favorite for the everest this saturday i'm sure you'll be, you'll be watching and cheering him so you guys bought him as well as a yearling is that right no he was retained by white a stud so he okay. was uh, um he was a very uh Bent legged fault. Yeah. Um, so he was wasn't going to be taken to. So he never actually went through the sales. Never went to public right. auction because right. should it um, felt like he'd be laughed off the sale ground for yeah. taking a horse with that deformity that he had. Um, which actually, by the time he got into the stable at Tiakia, he was a little bit turned out, but nowhere near as significant as uh, what his foal photo was. So they gelded him early, gave him time, let him come around naturally. Um, and yeah, he was a horse that came in um, with this little deformity or whatever. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, first trial, bang, game on. First start, one. Second start, group one. Second. Um, so he he was he was a good horse from from the day that he arrived as well. And the deformity in his leg, is it like it looks terrible, but it makes no impact on his galloping? No, he's, he's, he seems to have a very good action. Um, yeah. He's always sort of a little bit rotated out. So his, um, if you were looking at him walking at you straight, he, he would veer out a little bit, um, which they sort of call turned out, but uh, never seems to have affected him. Um, and he's the coolest horse to have anything to do with, really laid back, um, yeah. cool horse to have around. So, um, yeah, hopefully he can run really well again on the weekend. He's got a good record at Ramwick. He's drawn a nice soft gate, so uh, with a little bit of luck in running and running, um, yeah, cl cl clean air. Hopefully he can do a good job. Were you still be around for Saturday? Or you would have headed back by then? No, I won't be. I'm going back on uh, Thursday. Got uh, races again up, up at Chatham on Sunday. So uh, just, a, just a very short trip for the sales yesterday. Yeah, and so I wish I win came over to Australia permanently and I was wondering what, what the backstory there was for them to send him over here permanently. Uh, just the prize money. Yeah. Um, he was a gelding um, and Mark sort of said to me as well, have a gelding racing in Australia and mm -hmm. um, try and earn some good prize money. And obviously, Mark and um, uh, Moods have got a, a long history. So, uh, yeah, I think he came over and even even Moods and Chittick would say that, um, you know, he thought he's going to be a, a group or listed horse in the country cups or wherever it may be, but he's just gone from strength to strength. And he was always a little bit like that, like a very narrow, backward, immature sort of horse. And now that he's got 
uh, to a stage where he's fully mature, he's obviously doing a wonderful job. Mm. And that plane came off perfectly because he won the Golden Eagle, didn't he? He did. $10 million he, race. $10 million race. Uh, you know, just beat Fangirl. Uh, form is very strong. So, yeah. no, he's, he's done a wonderful job. And to put that in perspective, I, mean, I, I presume the prize money for that race is around $6 million bucks. And if I'm right, when you won the, the Trainers Premiership in New Zealand a few years back, you won total prize money of $6 million. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, something yeah which like that. shows the gulf between Australia and New Zealand in prize money. It's, yeah. So yeah. New Zealand has been in a, a, a tricky stage with you know, sort of a lack of government support. Um, but now that the uh, Intane boys have come in and uh, paired up and taken over the TAB, I think the future certainly looks a lot brighter for New Zealand than what it did 12 months ago. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about the Entain. So you're very positive about it and, and, and the overall sentiment over New Zealand is very positive about Entain taking over? Yeah, I think it's a lot better than it was uh, 12 months ago, even six months ago. So hopefully that leads to more horses staying in New Zealand and racing and less, yes. less coming to Australia. But obviously the top ones have still come across. But um, what they've put in place with prize money and um, different incentives, um, you know, I think it can only be very encouraging for the industry. Yeah, yeah, cool. So to finish off talking about Australian racing, everyone wants to see Imperatriz versus I Wish I Win up the straight six at Flemington on that Champions Day, mm -hmm. so to be the champion sprint. You both know both horses pretty well. I looked at the betting last night. Imperatriz is two thirty. I Wish I Win $4.00. Obviously, Imperatriz will get a couple of kilos off I Wish I Win because of the weight for age scale. If you had to have a bet, which way would you go? C considering the market. Considering the market, I'd say you'd have to play I Wish I Win, right? Um, uh, Nolan said there's only one horse that he's ridden that's quickened up better than him, mm. uh, which is a very interesting statement, obviously, yeah. referring to Black Caviar. But, um, yeah, a lot of respect for, for both horses. And uh, it'd be great to see them um, pair up and be there at their best and see who handles the straight well and um yeah it'd be a really interesting race yeah and were you surprised that tiaka didn't want to race imperatriz in the everest well it's something that we talked about a lot in hong kong um i can understand where they're coming from uh but it's a big carrot to turn down um yeah it's sort of not really for me to say yeah, too much bad, about bad but decision. uh that they've obviously got the manicato yeah. and the champion sprint so they're gonna concentrate on trying to win group ones to help your pedigree page um but yeah big, big call yeah big call would imperatives be good enough what's i mean obviously she will be good enough but do, would you like to see her in hong kong for the international meeting in december in, in the sprint race there um look I, i'm not sure that's I, I i don't think that she would come um yeah. uh, pretty tough on on fillies and mares doing that traveling and having to settle in um, but with the prize money that's now available in Australia, you don't see horses travelling as much as they used to. Yeah. And what about Royal Ascot? Like, we'll talk about David Ellis in a second, the principal of Tiako. Is Royal Ascot sort of on his bucket list? Has he ever, has he ever had a runner in Royal Ascot? Um, he bought a fast net rock horse up there in France. I forget his name. I'm sure he ran... He, he definitely won at Ascot, but I don't think he won at Royal Ascot. I just, okay. forget, I just forget his name. Mm. Um, Sir Peter Vella, Laurie Dixon, uh, DC and another guy were, were in him. Um, Jessica Harrington trained him. Uh, but other than that, I, I don't mm. think he has had, had a run at Royal Ascot. Because mm, it would be great to see. I, I love seeing New Zealand Aussie horses go to Ascot. It's always a pretty quiet time of the year, so I'd love to see Imperatrice go over and do that. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. I'm, I'm uh, you know, the stiff thousand would probably be a race, right? Yeah. Um, rather than the 12. Um, but, yeah... It, the best sprinters in Australia have a great record in, in, at, at Royal Ascot. So it would be fascinating to see, you know, who or I wish I win or both go. It'd yeah. Be, it'd be great. Yeah. It was, be great I wish spectacle. I win a chance because he's a gelding, isn't he? So Sure. Yeah. Um, so we sort of move towards your time in New Zealand. And I wanted to start by talking about Chris Waller. And I heard in a, one of your other interviews that you said that you had mimicked to a degree the way Chris has placed horses and maybe also his training methods and stuff. Have you watched him a lot over the last decade as his, his rise to sort of hyper success? Yeah, I, so um, when I was given the opportunity to train at Tiakau in a um, junior partnership role with Stephen Ortridge, I um, was a very keen racing man, understood uh, horses, but didn't understand a lot about programming and um, you know distances and trying to get the best out of your horses. So I spent quite a bit of time going through the uh, Racing New South Wales website, seeing 
where they trialed, how frequently they trialed, then when they raced compared to when they trialed. Obviously, I didn't know what work he was doing with them in between times, but I just got a bit of a foundation that, you know, uh, two trials, maybe a half-mile trial and then a thousand-metre trial a fortnight later and then maybe a race ten days after that sort of seemed to seemed to work pretty well. Um, so that was something that I was quite keen to quite keen to do. And, um, yeah, just for a young guy coming through, um, I just thought it was a good place to try and learn a little bit. I sort of spent quite a bit of time on my laptop um, studying. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, with Tiaka, um, David was handpicking 30 or 40 yearlings and then you were getting 20 nice yearlings or whatever it was from breeders. And uh, Although, you know, we were placing them right and doing things well, that, you know, you had, we had some really good stock as well. So yeah. it, was a, it was a melting pot of making sure that you were doing the small things right and placing the horses where they're going to be competitive and, and, you know, they've got a fantastic system, fantastic staff. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was a you know really enjoyable time at Tiak out having yeah. so much success. And tell us a bit about David Ellis. So you know he's not as well known in Australia as he would be in New Zealand, but we certainly see him pop up the sales and whatnot. I mean, he's, has he just been in horse racing all his life? Like I was reading up on him last night, it sort of said forty years ago he got into race horse ownership and wanted to share the experience with others, and that's sort of is that been the Tiak path ever since? Yeah. So D- DC uh, Dave was. Um, uh, a f- first and foremost, a farmer. Mm-hmm. Um, so his his main background is in uh, sheep and cattle. Um, so first and foremost, he, he is a farmer. That's his passion. He yeah. loves being out on the farm. Uh, he's mad on grass growing and fertilising and watching the weather and seeing when the rain's coming and making sure that the stock have got enough um, grass and water. And um, His farm at Tiakia has to be seen to be believed. He's mm-hmm. got... Uh, four or five thousand acres there and you can pretty much drive around the whole farm without opening a gate yeah. um so uh, that's a pretty pretty special place out there and i think um one of the good things about tiaki is that the horses go out there and spell um and they you know on really good uh, good clean grass and plenty of hard feed and they always come back and and look, look really good and i'm sure that's part of the success of the stable is having that sort of world-class um spelling facility that's um Never sort of uh, what I would say horse sick, like has too many horses on it. It's mm-hmm. always cross graze with cattle and, and sheep and uh, the horses always spell really well there. So, um, yeah, he's been a, a keen racing man all the way through. His first proper one was um, Tiaka Nick, who was um, Gay's yeah. first group one winner in the Metropolitan. Yeah. Uh, ran in the Melbourne Cup, ran second. He's a very good old horse. And, and then, that sort of got Gay going, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. And, and uh, um, Dave and Tommy... Smith were, were, were great mates, um, so I think it was a big thrill for Dave to uh, give um, Gay her first Group One winner, and then uh, he sort of started a stable up in uh, in Matamata, um, had a few different trainers, and um, yeah, I guess the rest is history. Always um, had a very good eye for a horse, um, and he's the most uh, fantastic salesman that you'll, mm. you'll ever like. He could sell. Snow to an Eskimo, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Ice to an Eskimo. He um, gets the owners out to the farm and drives around the farm, and uh, he's a great entertainer. Um, now Karen's involved in, in selling as well, and uh, she's a fantastic um, saleswoman. So they've got a really good team there, um, driven by good results from the racing stable, uh, and then buying good quality horses. So it's a really good recipe for success. Yeah, I heard you say that Tiako's success is won or lost in the yearling sales ring. Is that correct? Yeah. I, well, I was sort of, I believe, and Tiaka believes that um, the winning post is in the sales ring. If you're buying the right horses, uh, then you're always going to have, you know, nice horses in your stable to train um, and hopefully have success on the on the racetrack. So it's certainly a, a very important part. Um, you can't sit back and wait for people to send you horses. You've sort of got to get out there on the front foot and, and try and buy. And I've, I've tried to do that a little bit. From, from a Hong Kong perspective as well. Um, but, you know, those things take time. So certainly buying good quality yearlings and having a bit of, su- having a bit of luck uh, as well is, is very important. Yeah. And David has a crack at the sales. He's a lot of million-dollar horses, a lot of, a lot of success over the years, probably more than his fair share of success. What, what was the process when you were buying for Tiako? Like, I know it's a, it's a, there's a lot that goes into it, but in its simplest form... What did you guys do 
at the yielding sales to try and find the best prospects? Uh, I think we had a, a really good team, so uh, Dave always had the final decision. But, um, um, you know, Mark, um, there's a very influential guy called Joe Walls, who's the chairman of New Zealand Bloodstock. Uh, him and Dave look at all the yearlings together. Um, he's got a great eye for an horse and he's a good friend. Um, so he certainly deserves to have a bit of credit for picking out some really nice horses. And then um, we've got a really good vet, uh, Doug Black, and his team. Um, so, yeah, I think I rule just having a, a good team of, of people and then having a, a big boss at the top there that was fearless in his approach to trying to buy the best horses to have in the stable, yeah. um, forming stallion syndicates to buy the million-dollar colts or forming filly syndicates to um, uh, try and buy the best fillies. But then also um, buying some you know inexpensive horses as well to create new ownership opportunities yeah. for, for people that were sort of first-timers. Because TRK is for everyone, isn't it? Like it is, yep. yeah. And I think it can never be underestimated the success that he's had with um, you know cheap yearling purchases. Mm. Um, I remember back in the very early days before I got there, um, probably before I was even born, was a horse called Integrate, who I think he paid twenty or thirty grand for at the Magic Millions um, sale, and she went on to to win an awful lot of money in a lot of races. So um, yeah, he's got a great eye for a horse. Um, does a lot of research on pedigrees and a lot of homework, um, but also, you know, can can pick a cheapie as well, which I reckon is mm. uh, really cool and something that can never be underestimated. Mm. And so you, you sort of rose to the top of Tiako around sort of 25, 26. It's very, very young to be given the reins of a, of a huge operation like that. Did you have to push really hard to be get given to be given the job or was it? Um, so I was training in, in partnership with uh, Stephen Ortridge, who's mm -hmm. uh, a good friend and a great mentor, taught me a lot. Um, so we trained in partnership for a couple of years. Then there were a few little things that, that happened, um, a few little niggly things. We missed a couple of um, late nomination fees and stuff like that. And Steve just got to the stage where he's happy just to sort of take a bit of a step back. Yeah. Um, he said, ah... Oh, you know, I don't really want to be training that many anymore. And uh, it actually ended up really well for Steve because he went and worked for uh, Kevin Hickman and he ran the Bellacci operation for a while and now he's just sort of doing his own thing. Uh, got a lot of respect for Steve and, as I say, taught me a lot. So then I sort of took the opportunity um, to train on my own, um, which was which was massive. And, um, you know, big thanks to Dave and Karen and, and Mark Walker, who was up in Singapore at the time, for being afforded that opportunity. And then, as happens when things change, staff leave, um, people think, you know, young fella not going to make it. Um, so I had to call on some family and friends to, to come give me a hand. So my dad came and worked for us at Tiakau, and my sister came and um, helped out in the office, which were two pretty important parts of the uh, success. And obviously Dave was very heavily involved and... Um, you know, always a good good sort of sounding board. Um, so, yeah, there was some testing times in there when you're a young fella and things aren't going right, um, but also a, a lot of success that was, uh, you know, very enjoyable as well. Yeah. And is life was life more intense as a trainer for Tiaka than it is now as a trainer in Hong Kong, is it? Uh, I think it, both places are, are intense for different reasons. Yeah. Um, Hong Kong, you're not training as many horses, you're not doing as much travelling. Uh, in New Zealand, you're racing every day. Uh, you're working a lot more horses. Um, long distances. Long distances. There's a lot of other things happening. Um, you know, you're worrying about your staff and all of those sorts of things, whereas in Hong Kong, the jockey club look after all of that side of things yeah. um, for you. Um, but I, I would say both high-pressure jobs, but in different ways. And so it brings a question like why, why walk away from – I mean, was it the last season in New Zealand you trained 160 winners, won the premiership easily – Broke the record, 160 was a record. Mm. And then you walk away from all that to go and start all again in Hong Kong. Why? Yeah, yeah I just sort of got to the stage where um, we felt like we'd achieved all we could achieve in New Zealand. Um, obviously, things weren't great then in terms of prize money. Um, we were looking at, uh, well, TRK were looking at setting up a stable in Australia, which they've subsequently done. Mm -hmm. um, we were trying to get some boxes in, in Sydney and, and weren't able to. Um, and I just sort of felt like it was an opportunity for myself and Danielle to stand down our own two feet, um, have a crack and, mm. uh, you know, 
put ourselves against some of the best trainers in the world and you know it, it just felt like it was the right time to try something new mm. and so on that like obviously hong kong's home now for the next decade however long but do you look at racing around the world and look at other jurisdictions europe japan even america and think that one day you'd like to train in one of those jurisdictions uh probably not i think um once i've done my 10 15 20 years in hong kong however long it is i think that would be enough yeah. um and i'd like to enjoy you know a nice retirement and do a bit of traveling and do all of those sorts of things so um i think once i'm finished in hong kong that'll, that'll probably be it yeah so why don't we move to hong kong so you're out in sydney for the ready to race sale the english ready to race sale and i thought if you can tell us a bit about why you're here and what you're looking for at that sale it'll help us sort of start to understand a bit more about hong kong and how hong kong works because it is a very different system to what we have here yeah so i think if you start from the top and i'll just try and skim through this as quickly as i can so um to race a horse in hong kong you have to be a member of the jockey club mm. um so when you're a member of the jockey club you uh, apply to the club to um, get a permit to import a horse. And yep. there's two types of permits. There's a PP permit, which is a, um, a race horse with a rating of 63 or above, or there's a PPG permit, which is a griffin, which is an unraced horse. Um, so those um, permits are allocated each year. Um, most of the owners that, that want a permit get it, but there is some that, that miss out and then they have to you know wait a year or uh, whatever it may be. So um, when you're coming out to these um, ready-to-race sales, you, you're looking to buy... Um, horses to fill the PPG permits. Right. And one thing that's good about the um, uh, ready to race sale or ready to run sale in New Zealand is that basically those horses, uh, you can tell the owner that you're buying for that that horse will be in Hong Kong within 12 months. Mm -hmm. So it'll get there when it's a, a three year old and then it can race. Um, and it's a reasonably cost effective way of buying horses mm. um the trial market now has got very expensive mm -hmm. um through hong kong and through horses being bought for australia as well mm. um so we're out here trying to buy horses that are by size that suit hong kong uh when you're buying from the breeze up sales you can see their action uh they're that next stage along from when you were buying them if you're buying them as yearlings uh and they're also not as quite as expensive as buying a trial horse Mm. Um, so that's that's probably the reason that we're here. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to buy anything yesterday. Um, but there's some nice horses that will go up there and there's owners that have bought horses through different agents that maybe will get the opportunity to train. Um, but we bought a couple of nice horses out of the sale last year, a Purin Kanto and a Capitalist that are back in New Zealand going through the trial system now with my family um, that will be coming to Hong Kong in the next, next two or three months. Yeah, nice. And so settling into Hong Kong, is there people over there who have helped you? So Lenny, you sort of, it sounds like you're reasonably close with Zach, people like that. Yeah, Zach, Zach's, been a, Zach's been a big help. Um, obviously he's been there sort of 15 or 16 years now and uh, understands the system, how it all works. Um, and understands the difficulties when you arrive. Yeah. I don't think it can be underestimated what a brutal place it is when you're trying to get going. Um, you know... I rung Zach the other day and said, God, having a bad run, horses done a tendon, uh, one scratch, race check, knee, stable transfer one. Um, and he said to me, when you're driving down the road in Australia, you lose a hubcap. And you, you th think, oh, shit, you know, things are going bad. Whereas in Hong Kong, you might drive down the road and all four of your wheels will fall off and yeah. you'll be rolling along the road on your rims. And honestly, that yeah. that's, that's what happens in Hong Kong. You get on these terrible runs where things just aren't going well yeah uh, and it's just like come on get, give me a break yeah. um so hopefully um now that i've had a few bad things go wrong in the early part of the season and the horses haven't been running as well as what i might have liked hopefully we can start to build a bit of momentum and and get things um get things back on the get things back going the way that we want them to um and another reason why i came down here was just to get away for a couple of days just yeah. have a bit of a refresh and Hopefully when I go back up on Thursday, things will be starting to click again and we yeah. can we can get going. But um, Zach's been a big help. Um, and obviously my, my fiancée, Danielle, is up there and she's a uh, she's a great uh, sounding board or a punching bag or not in a um, physical sense, physical but sense, yeah. uh, she uh, understands what a difficult place it is and how we have to ride the wave. And yeah. 
yeah. wait wait for things to wait for things to to turn our way. Um, uh, David Hayes has been a great great sounding board. He's uh, been there and done that, and uh, he's been a um, a good sounding board as well. And there's m- many other people that you talk to. My assistant trainer Jones, um, so he handles the staff and has a bit to do with the owners, and um, he's a good sounding board as well. But I think the the, the biggest thing about Hong Kong is you've just got to be patient. You've yep. just got to wait for things to happen. You can't force it. Um, and I believe hopefully I can be a better trainer than I was last year and hopefully be a better trainer next year and um, just waiting for better quality stock to mature and you know hopefully we can have some good results at, you know heading into partway through the season and the back half of the season. So you had 35 winners last year. You were content with that? That was about... Yeah, I thought that was a good effort, yeah. um, particularly the first couple of... The first two months of the season, I really didn't know what I was doing or, yeah. or how to get things going. Did you ever have second thoughts? You go, what have I done? Oh, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. You're just you know, <laughs> driving home from Happy Valley at 11.30 on a Wednesday night knowing you've got to get up in a couple of hours. And what, you know, why, yeah. did I, why did I do this to myself? <laughs> um, but then you, know, you get on a good run and you train a couple of winners and, and you have a look at your bank balance yeah. uh, and you think, yeah, I've certainly, certainly made the right decision. Yeah. So... Um, um, yeah, Hong Kong's a very difficult place, but um, um, hopefully we can continue to improve and, and have a bit more luck and mm. all of those sorts of things will start to fall into place. Are you a super competitive person like Zach is? Like, do you do you need to win the Trainers Premiership eventually? Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah great. It has to happen, yeah. So okay. uh, just got to got to work towards that. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, so John Size is a great example of... Um, Hong Kong racing so he went there maybe 20 years ago um, and he was a complete breath of fresh air um, understand understood how to feed the horses how to work the horses um, and because he's been there and he's been so successful for so long he's then taught the assistant trainers how he trains um, mm. Frankie Law you know young I think were assistants to to John Moore and, and John Size and as the expatriate trainers have been there for so long um, They've learnt, the Chinese have learnt how to become really good trainers. Um, and then you put into that mix um, uh, pre-made feeds. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier to feed the horses now. Um, and then I don't think it can be underestimated, the language barrier. Yeah. Um, the Chinese trainers are really, really strong now. Um, so I'm trying to learn a little bit of Cantonese, which is... You know, very difficult language. And they speak um, so fast. <laughs> oh, they speak fast, and you know, you go through the premiership. Um, so John size last year, but then the f- five or six after that were all locals, uh, including Casper, who's sort of, you know, you could say he's born and bred in Hong Kong, could speak yeah. Cantonese. Um, so there's a lot of challenges up there. The, the Chinese are very, very strong trainers now. Mm. Um, whereas when size or more first arrived, perhaps they weren't. Um, and I think that just goes to show that the jockey club have brought the right people in to make their product better. And I yeah. think everything comes back to educating the local workforce to, to make the local workforce better. Yeah. Um, the expatriate jockeys coming in um, have certainly taught the, the local jockeys how to be better. Um, and you look at um, Vincent Ho or uh, Derek Long or Matthew Chadwick or whoever it may be, you know, they're, they're, they're world-class riders in their own right now. Yeah. Um, Vincent's been competitive in Japan. Um, Chadwick went and rode in the um, the Invitational race there at Ascot. Um, so the the place is very very competitive. Yeah. yeah. And what about placing horses and doing the form over in Hong Kong? Do you spend a lot of time doing that, or do you get help with that? Yeah, I, I do get a little bit of help with that, but I I do it do it myself as well. Um, and that's something that's that's really important. Um, but you sort of go through and you get in a bit of a system of what works for you. Uh, running your horses once a month or with a trial in between times or knowing that that horse needs to drop points so we'll just keep running him until he gets to his mark and then we'll give him a bit of a freshen up and hopefully he can find his form again but it's a you know it's a really difficult place the way that the entries work um so arriving from New Zealand knowing that when you put your entries in if your horses were the top rated horses they were always going to get a run so you could have two or three or four horses and you you know in, in each race Whereas in Hong Kong, the entries are done by by the trainer to create fairness and equality. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it took a little while to get used to, but it, it's a very, very fair place. And I think the reason that they do it like that is to 
um, obviously generate turnover through bidding, knowing that um, everything's fair and regulated. And yeah, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of different things that go into it that the jockey club manage extremely well. The trainers allowed to bet in Hong Kong? They are allowed to bet. Um, I, I don't I don't bet. I've got a I believe I've got enough to lose or win with with the prize money, and I hate giving it back. Um, so I, I I don't I don't bet. But you know, there's a few trainers that do, and um, you know that, that that's that's a, that's up to them. Yeah. So a couple more simple questions to finish off. Are you an All Blacks fan? I am an All Blacks fan. Yeah, looking forward to uh, big game on Sunday morning. Sunday morning, yeah. Hopefully we can uh, hopefully we can keep going. I think uh, leading into the World Cup and getting a flogging, and then yeah, uh, France smashing us in the first round's been a, been a wake up call for the boys. So hopefully. Uh, you know, hopefully they can get going. It's unusual that the All Blacks are the smoky of the tournament, but they could just duck and weave. And yeah, that's right. And there's um, obviously been a lot of conversation about coaches and key mm. players and uh, motivation and all of those sorts of things. But hopefully the culture's there and hopefully they can um, lean on each other and continue to work their way through until hopefully the semi and then into the final. Yeah. Could you see yourself being the All Black coach when you're finished in Hong Kong? Oh, no, not at all. No, <laughs> I, I uh, actually... Got invited along to speak to some rugby coaches in Hong Kong the other day, uh, which was quite cool. And um, I said, I, I, I am a coach, right? But I, I can't interact with my basic. I can't interact with my staff, and I can't interact with my horses. So <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, so you have to learn to read horses' body language, yeah. and then you need your um, your riding lads and your head head lads and your AT to be able to translate and get the mafus to sort of do what you want them to do. So the Marfus are the uh, what we call stable boys. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, Hong Kong's got a lot of challenges. Yeah. And the final question. Um, so you sort of said that you know probably 10, 15, 20 years from now you'd, you'd like to sort of take the, the foot off the pedal. And is there a particular part of New Zealand where you'd love to go and settle down and you know have it set yourself up and? Um, yeah, well, that'll be interesting. I, the pace of life in Hong Kong is very different to New Zealand, very different to anywhere else in, in the rest of the world. Um, and whether retiring in New Zealand is going to be where we want to be or whether we want to retire somewhere here like Sydney where we enjoy the, um, enjoy the uh, weather, enjoy the city. Um, so whether it's Australia or whether it's New Zealand or whether it's doing some travel and uh, watching the kids grow up, or I, I don't know what it looks like, but yeah. we'll certainly um, we've got a long road to go to to, to, to go. be thinking about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's plenty of conversations to be had around that. Yeah, in the so future. It, could, it could be anywhere in the world. Could be, yeah. yeah. Um, we, we we love Australia. Um, we also love New Zealand. Um, we've got um, a lot of friends here in Sydney and in Melbourne, um, and obviously a lot of family in, in New Zealand. Um, but those New Zealand winters, they're, they're a killer. Yeah. I, I, I hate that. I hate, <laughs> I, I hate the cold. So um, we'll just have to see how it all works out. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Everyone's enjoying watching your rise and your professionalism and your um, motivation. So keep it up. Uh, long way to go. You've done really well so far. So thank you. Thank you. Good luck, buddy. Cheers.